This is Matthew Cratter from Trade University, and today I want to talk about whether hyperinflation is coming soon to the U.S. This is all based on a tweet from Jack Dorsey that has a lot of people talking this weekend. The tweet is, inflation is go going to change everything. It's happening. Now, hyperinflation is something very specific. We know what inflation is when prices of goods and services go, go up or the purchasing power of a currency goes down, hyperinflation has a very particular economic definition, and that means the monthly inflation rate, this is really by definition, the monthly inflation rate has to exceed 50%, and then a hyperinflationary episode will end when the monthly inflation rate drops below 50% and stays that way for at least a year. Now, this is extremely, extremely high inflation to say the least. If we look at CPI inflation in the U.S. right now, which is sort of a fake, uh, a fake indicator, I believe that real inflation is much higher than this. Uh, the CPI index is showing year-over-year -year inflation of just over 5%. So this is the consumer price index, according to the government. The PPI, the producer price index, is looking at higher inflation rates, especially if we look at the change in final demand year over year. We can see that it's really been accelerating since 2020 when we had sub 1% PPI inflation rates. And then the whole year it's been trending up upwards in 2021, starting at about 1.6% inflation, the last reading about 8.6%. Again, this is producer price inflation. So those are two ways of measuring it. You have to trust the government statistics, which historically have always understated the true inflation rate. Another thing that a lot of people look at is they just look at the growth rate of the M2 money supply as a way of getting a handle on what the debasement rate is of the US dollar and hence long-term inflation. M2 money growth was really at its highest from February uh, 2020 to February 2021, going at a 27 percent rate year over year, and it has since decelerated down to about a 13 percent. Either way, if we look at these numbers anywhere from 5 percent to 8 percent to even at the peak, 25 percent, we're not anywhere close to hyperinflation as defined by 50 percent month over month. If you compound 50 percent month over month, you end up with very high inflation rates for year over year. If we take a look at commodity prices, we're getting a little bit closer maybe to hyperinflation. We can see commodity prices year over year, the energy complex up the most, and then followed by food, uh, grains, etc. Obviously gold not, not doing very well in this environment. One reason uh, we talked about dumping gold for the past year, this has been a good call so far. What we're also seeing, though, it's interesting, we're seeing inflation among commodities that are not exchange traded, that don't really have futures or exchanges that, tr that trade them. These are more over the counter. These are, these are definitely needed for industrial uh, processes, things like cloth and burlap and tin and rubber, et cetera, tallow prices. If you make an index of this using Bloomberg, it looks like you end up with very high inflation as well. So we can't just say it's some sort of financial inflation that makes its way through the futures exchanges. We're definitely seeing it in many, many different areas. If you're finding this video helpful so far, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Maybe share this video with a few friends as well. Now, this is not to say that hyperinflation isn't occurring in various parts of the world. It's very easy to forget uh, how lucky we are if we live in the US or Europe or Canada or Australia, that our, our inflation rates are, are certainly much lower than parts of the world like Venezuela, Zimbabwe, Turkey. I'm not sure if this is, there's been some debate online whether this is true, uh, but supposedly the Turkey, the ATMs in Turkey are replacing the double zero with the triple zero. This is what happens with hyperinflation. You have to start adding zeros to prices and uh, increasing them by an order of magnitude. Definitely high inflation rates, hyperinflation in Turkey, and uh, I would say in Lebanon as well. Zimbabwe, the official inflation rate, definitely hyperinflationary, uh, 51 uh, 
51%. This may be this may be year over year. It's always hard to get these exact numbers. If you look at CPI transportation inflation, it's in it's in the thousands. Now, what does this mean for financial markets when you have hyperinflation? A lot of people don't realize, but one of the things that happens is real estate prices skyrocket and uh, stock prices go up a lot as well. So the Zimbabwe, you wouldn't think of Zimbabwe as an especially well-run or successful country. And that being said, the stock market there is up 355% since the beginning of 20. 21. Now, this is not as good of a thing as it seems simply because the currency that's denominated in has been going down faster than the rate that the stocks have been going up. But if we think about what's happening in the US, what's been happening over the past few years, we've really had this melt up. It's not quite like Zimbabwe, but it may certainly be what we're seeing in the housing market, what we're seeing in the stock market is not necessarily that asset prices are going up, but that the denominator, the, the fiat currency, is rapidly going down. And if this is true for expecting hyperinflation in the US, we would actually expect the stock market to start to go up hundreds percent every single year and possibly uh, possibly every, mo every month. Zimbabwe has had months where the stock market has been up, uh, you call it, uh, you call it a, a couple hundred percent even, even in a single month. But the bizarre thing about Jack's tweet is that it's suggesting that hyperinflation is going to happen in the U.S. soon, and then there'll be this ripple effect where it spreads elsewhere. If, if true, this is extremely serious. The U.S. dollar is still obviously the global reserve currency, and when the U.S. sneezes, the whole world catches cold because of all the financial interconnections and how everyone is basically on a treasury, U.S. Treasury reserve, uh, reserve status and the global, uh, global reserve currency. So this is, I don't quite see where Jack is getting these numbers. And uh, the question a lot of people have been asking on Twitter is what data exactly is Jack seeing that makes him expect hyperinflation in the U.S.? And if you put out a tweet like this, it's not your, I, I assume Jack's not saying we're going to get hyperinflation or in 10 or 20 years, that it, but that it's coming in the near future. So people have, have hypothesized maybe he's seen some data coming through Square, which he's also uh, the CEO of, and uh, there's, there's seen some sort of payment data that shows that prices are accelerating. Maybe, maybe this is better data or more honest data that the, than the Federal Reserve is, is receiving or the Federal Reserve economists are publishing about. So there's some speculation here. I would suspect that it's something even more obvious, and that would be, uh, this would correlate with Peter Thiel's recent comment that Bitcoin at 60,000 is a canary in the coal mine. It tells us that uh, this is really the only, only, as we've said before on this channel, it's the only, Bitcoin is really the only honest thermostat left in the room. It's the only honest indicator because the central bank is suppressing bond interest rates and we have uh, CPI and PPI data that's heavily massaged. Uh, and so the, so um, what Peter's suggesting here is that Bitcoin is the canary in the coal mine. And if I had to guess, I would guess that this is what Jack is looking at. He's sort of working backwards from Bitcoin uh, as this completely free market. You can say it's manipulated by the whales, etc. It is very volatile. That being said, we know that Bitcoin has gone up about, uh, call it 6x over the past over the past year, and that would that would suggest uh, sort of hyperinflationary uh, dynamics, at least if you're pricing stuff in Bitcoin. If we were to enter inflation, hyperinflation in the U.S. and get monthly inflation rates of 50 percent, just to really back of the envelope, and the compounding actually would probably make this even more extreme. But you would expect Bitcoin, if your purchasing power is being cut in half every month, you would expect Bitcoin to roughly double every month. So if we're currently at 60,000, you'd expect it to double for every month, roughly, that you got 50% hyperinflation. This would put us at close to $2 million per Bitcoin by March of next year. So I'm not saying that this is going to happen. We could get to, um, I certainly think we're going to get to Bitcoin 200,000 by the end of this year. I'm a, I, I would not want to bet money that we're going to be at $2 million by the end of the first quarter of next year. That being said, if you own Bitcoin, if you're not trading in and out of it, trying to top ticket, 
you are protected. You are protected if the U.S. happens to make a policy error and to slide into hyperinflation. I would say I would disagree with Jack. I don't think we're going to have hyperinflation. Maybe he's not using it really in a technical sense of 50% per month, but he's just talking about high inflation. As we've talked about many times on, the cha on this channel, the real problem is that total federal debt, total U.S. federal government debt, as a percentage of GDP, is higher than it's been at any other point in history since really the end of World War II. In the uh, second quarter of 2020, we we're at 135%. A more normal level is some, somewhere around 50, 60, 70%. This is where we were at the beginning of, we were actually below that. We were at like 30% when Paul Volcker raised interest rates to try to stop inflation in the late 70s, early 80s. We're now at a point where there's so much leverage in the system, especially as measured by debt to GDP, that you cannot have interest rates rise a lot. Instead, what you have to do is debase the currency. This is made even worse by the fact that the government's bringing in about $4 trillion in tax revenue every year. We're spending about $7 trillion. And so we have this def deficit, what's called the budget deficit, that has to be plugged, about a $3 trillion budget deficit every year. This is what the U.S. needs to borrow in order to keep spending at the rate that it's spending. We need to sell debt about uh, $3 trillion a year. Current total uh, on balance sheet debt for the federal government is about $28, $29 uh, trillion. And so if you're adding $3 trillion to that every year, you're growing the debt by more than, uh, more than 10% every single year year. The historical rate that, that, that the debt has grown really since the, uh, I, I did this back to 2008, really the beginning, early 2008, the beginning of the great financial crisis, when total government debt was about $9.4 trillion. It's now about $28 trillion. That gives us an annual growth rate of about 8 to 9% compounded. We're growing the debt rate, as we said, at more than 10% per year now. And what this means is that we need to grow if we want basically if we want this ratio to come down this ratio of debt to gdp we have to either decrease the the rate that the debt is growing which seems very difficult to do because the government doesn't want to stop spending uh, or we need to increase the rate at which the economy is growing as measured by gdp and so if you have debt growing somewhere between eight and call it 12 percent per year you actually have to grow gdp at more than 8 to 12% per year in order to bring down this debt to GDP ratio. We can see that GDP has really been growing. If we eyeball this, it's been growing more like 5% a year since the early 90s. And then we've obviously had a lot of uh, volatility surrounding the events of the past 12 to 18 months. The only way to lower de de debt to GDP levels is to really increase either the productivity of the economy through sort of technological advances. If we were to come up with cold fusion or some amazing energy advance, that would do it. But the more likely way is that we do enter a period of inflation where we grow GDP. We don't really grow real GDP, but we grow nominal GDP by letting inflation run hot. So I'm definitely uh, bullish on inflation. It's, it's a nasty thing, but I think that's where we're headed. I don't see hyperinflation coming to the US anywhere soon. But if it does, um, if it does, you and I are prepared to the extent that we own Bitcoin. And uh, I think we could see a situation, certainly at this point in the cycle, where Bitcoin melts up into the hundreds of thousands very soon, even without hyperinflation. But if we were to get a bout of hyperinflation in the U.S., this would obviously, it's not something I'm hoping for. This would be very bad for the society. It would uh, aggravate wealth inequality rates. There would be... Um, There'd probably be people starving, there'd be riots and civil war and possibly global war as well. So definitely not something to hope for. But if it happens, uh, Bitcoin really is our black swan insurance against events like this. Bitcoin is a canary in the coal mine and Bitcoin will continue to preserve our purchasing power. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.